Welcome to Bible Tract Echoes. This program is the radio ministry of Bible Tracts Incorporated. Our mission is to take the Word of God to all the world. Our Bible teacher is the director of Bible Tracts, Pastor Mark Smith. Since 1938, Bible Tracts Incorporated has been publishing clear gospel tracts and supplying them to churches, missionaries, and individuals all over the world, and all at no charge. Information on how you can receive a free sample pack of our tracts will be given at the end of this broadcast. Now for our Bible study, here is our teacher, Pastor Mark Smith. Hello, my friend. Welcome to the middle of the week. I hope your week is going well. Right now, my Bible sits open to the book of 2 Peter chapter 3, if at all possible. Right now, reach over, pick up your own copy of the Word of God and join me there. 2 Peter, please, chapter 3. I'll be reading verses 15 and 16 here in just a moment, along with getting your Bible open, if possible. Get something on which you can jot some notes. I think that'll be effective for you. I also have a gospel tract I want to talk to you about. Do you know what a gospel tract is? And that word tract is spelled T-R-A-C-T, a a gospel tract. I'm referring to an evangelism tool. It's a short written presentation of God's plan of salvation. I want to give you some gospel tracts. Right now, our ministry has completed 80 years. Our foot is into our 81st year of giving away gospel tracts all over the world in different languages, free of charge. We pay the shipping. Now, of course, we're able to do that because so many people and churches, even some businesses, help us to do that. They help underwrite us by their faithful support. But we are able to give to God's people, to churches, gospel workers all over the world, tools by which they can reach out to their people in their community and tell them about the great love and salvation in Jesus Christ. I'm going to talk about one tract here in just a minute, but I want to prepare us for our Bible study this way. Here's a question for you. How much authority does the Bible have anyway? Now, really, to answer the question, I need to qualify or perhaps say I need to narrow my question. Recently, many of the denominations around the world, which really did begin as Bible-based groups, have been struggling with this authority issue. Issues like, when does life begin? What is marriage? Issues like, am I a boy? Am I a girl? Am I something else? And the list goes on. Whole issues over which people are struggling. Recently, a man published a book titled, The Pelican Book on Hell. Well, the writer is anything but a Christian at all. But in the book, he openly says that the New Testament has not changed on what it says about hell. Hell. But then he goes on to say that we don't like what it says, so we're going to believe something else. Now, whether you're talking about hell or the deity of Christ, the virgin birth, or the way to be saved from sin, all of these issues begin with one basic underpinning question. How much authority does the Bible have over my belief system, my actions, my family, my church, my whole life? Tell me, friend, How would you answer that question? And then I ask, are your actions, are my actions and opinions paralleling what we say we believe about Bible authority? Get your Bible and join me in 2 Peter, please, in chapter 3. I mentioned a moment ago those gospel tracts. I have one of the tracts that's in a sample packet I want to send to you free of charge. This one's entitled, Peace in Terminal illness, peace in terminal illness. Every family on the planet has been touched, whether a close family member, an extended family member, a close friend, everybody's been touched with the fact that somebody they know and love has had a terminal illness and it's taken their life. Our founder had cancer, had bone cancer. It took his life. But there was such peace in terminal illness, and he wrote this track um, to people who are facing that and how to have peace in their life 
even though they know they're, they're soon going to step out into eternity. They can have peace because they know they're in a right relationship with God Almighty through Jesus Christ, his son. They're ready to face eternity in heaven and escape hell because Jesus is their savior. It's a great track, Peace and Terminal Illness. It's just one of the tracks in a sample packet I want to send you. Be ready at the end of the broadcast when my announcer gives three methods by which you can contact us, giving us your name and your address. Do that and we'll send this free sample packet to you. You can go to our website and order the sample packet there. Our website is Bible Tracks Inc. Dot O-R-G. That word tracks is spelled T-R-A-C-T-S, BibleTracksInc.org. All right, verse 15 and 16 of 2 Peter 3 says this, an account that the long-suffering of our Lord is salvation, even as our beloved brother Paul, also according to the wisdom given unto him, hath written unto you, as also in all his epistles, speaking in them of such th- these things, in which are some things hard to be understood, which they that are unlearned and unstable rest, that means they, they change, as they do also the other scriptures unto their own destruction." Verses 11 to 16 of the chapter here is a section which I have titled with one word. The word is following. It's a section on how believers need to follow God while they live in a day filled with false teachers who deny Jesus, they deny his second coming, and they deny that Jesus will ever judge sinners. Peter ends this segment here by identifying a comrade. In the second half of verse 15, and then spilling over in verse 16, it talks about who that comrade is. I have four words, all beginning with the letter I, like in the word Indiana, that will help me lay out what we find here in verses 15 and 16. Word number one is the word identified. Identified. In verse 15, Peter here identifies the comrade in ministry. That comrade is the Apostle Paul. Peter calls Paul his beloved brother. In short, what is going to happen here is Peter's going to say that what Paul has been preaching and writing about uh, is going to agree, it does agree with Peter because they both got their truth from the same source. They got it from God. So word number one is the word identified. But now, word number two is the word inspiration. Inspiration, it's still based upon verse 15. Now, it is true that the word inspired or inspiration does not occur here in the verse. But what we find here is that Peter is giving authority to both his own writings and the writings of the apostle Paul. He does so, verse 15 says, because they got wisdom given to them to write their New Testament epistles. There are a number of key verses here in 2 Peter that deal with this whole subject of Bible authority. And by the way, that word inspiration, it is found in the Bible. It's found in 2 Timothy 3.16. That verse says that the word inspired means God breathed. That's what the word means. Or to put another way, that the Bible came out of God. It is God breathed. Your breath comes from the inside of you. Well, that's the image used here to help us understand that the origin, the source of Scripture is out of God. Now, if your Bible is open here to 2 Peter, look at 2 Peter 3, verse 2. It says this, that ye may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets, that's a reference to Old Testament writings, and the commandments of us, the apostles of the Lord and Savior. What has Peter just done here? He has done two things. Number one, he has put New Testament writings on equal status, equal footing with the inspired Old Testament scriptures. Both are inspired. But number two, Peter is demonstrating that he knows he is involved in giving inspired scriptures. He knows he is. Now look here at verse 13 of our chapter. This verse begins with these words. I'm quoting now. Nevertheless, we, according to his, that is God's promise, look for a new heaven and a new earth. The promise here being talked about refers to Old Testament prophecies. 
And once again, Peter says that his writings and teachings are equal to and agree with the Old Testament. Now, in our verse here, in verse 15, Peter says that the teachings and writings of the Apostle Paul are also inspired. They, too, are equal in authority to the Old Testament writing and to Peter's writing. But if you can, turn back to chapter 1 of 2 Peter. There in that chapter, Peter says that Scripture is even more authoritative for you and I than any earthly experience and even words, listen now, words uttered out of heaven. Now, my saying that ought to cause you to stop, sit back in your chair, and take a real deep, long breath. In chapter 1, Peter talks about Jesus being on the Mount of Transfiguration. He talks about that voice, the voice of God the Father, talking out of heaven. Yet Peter says in chapter 1 and verse 18, I'm reading now, This voice which came from heaven we heard when we were with him, that is Jesus, in the holy mount. And verse 19 says, We have also a more sure, more dependable word of prophecy, whereunto ye do well that you take heed. Chapter 1 of 2 Peter goes on to describe the method God used to transfer Scripture from out of his person through human beings onto the paper that you and I later get our Bibles from. Verse 21 says this of chapter 1, For the prophecy, that is Scripture, came not in old time by the will of men, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit. Now, with all this being true about our Bible, then we come back and ask this. How do we answer the authority question? How much authority does the Bible have over me, over my family, over my church, over my opinions, over my voting, over how I manage my family unit and how I discipline my children and whatnot? Well, the Bible has, in essence, the only authority. It alone has authority. That doesn't mean that as a citizen you don't live under the authority of what, whether the Constitution or whatever the laws are of your area of land. Yes, we're under that. But when it comes to knowing what we're going to believe and our ethics and morality, only the Bible has authority. No human leaders, no matter whether their title is bishop or pope or pastor or, or high-exalted mucky muck, <laughs> it matters nothing. No visions, no dreams, no books about being 90 minutes in heaven, no words uttered by some unknown babble. None of these have any authority. Only when we, as leaders or individuals, use clear Bible passages to preach and teach, is there any authority to be found. So tell me, friend, what is the authority that you're resting on that gives you assurance you're going to heaven? If it's on the fact that you think that you're a pretty good person, you have terrible authority. You're trusting you. The Bible says you're not a good person. You're a sinner. All of sin to come short of the glory of God. And the wages for our sin, yours and mine, is death, eternal death, eternal separation from God in a literal place of fire called hell. But God's salvation is found in the person of his son. For God sent forth his son to save you from your sin. Receive him. On the authority of God, receive him as your Savior today. Thank you for joining us today for Bible Tract Echoes. If you would like to receive a free sample packet of our tracks, you can contact us by calling 309-828-6888. Our mailing address is Bible Tracks, P.O. Box 188, Bloomington, Illinois, 61702. Again, our phone number is 309-828-6888, and our mailing address is P.O. Box 188, Bloomington, Illinois, 61702. You can also contact us through our website. Our web address is BibleTracksInc.org. Remember, the word tracks is spelled T-R-A-C-T-S. That address is BibleTracksInc.org. May the Lord richly bless you as you serve Him.